it's from me again. <laughs> um, sorry, my hair is a little messed up. Um, I was under my fort. Yeah, I made a fort. Kind of jealous of the whole hunker bunker thing. Um, so today I thought I'd make a fort. I did make a fort. I was going to make the fort. I mean, I did make the fort, but then I was going to film underneath the fort, right? Cool. Hunker bunker over here. And it didn't work. Let me show you my fort. <laughs> Do you see it? Yeah. It just, it, it kept falling. It kept falling in the middle. I don't know. So tomorrow we need some fort ideas. Like, I have lost my touch. Man, I was good at it when my little guys were young. I've forgotten all the tricks. I used a vacuum cleaner because I thought that would like prop up in the middle, but then there was no room for me. I don't know. Sad. I feel sad that I've lost my touch, but hopefully you guys can help me tomorrow. So anyway, that was my fun, exciting thing, but it didn't work. Um, okay. Chapter 23. Um, you know, I feel like one more thing. I know I'm getting off on a tangent, but I haven't lately, right? You've seen that. Uh, I just feel like I wanted to say something about this piece behind me and this china. This piece is, it's called a hutch, um, a dining room hutch. And it, my great grand, my, my grandparents had it. So it's been in our family for a long time. It's handmade from Iowa, from an Amish community, which is kind of like, um, um, well, they're different. They're, it's like an Amish community, but it's a different name. Mennonite, I think. Um, I'll find out. And so my grandparents bought it from them, and the table is matches it. And then the china my, my dad brought back for my mom uh, before they got married, um, before he even asked her to, to get married. He figured that she'd say yes when, once he did. Um, and it's from uh, Japan. And it's really pretty china. So they gave me that lately. These are two new new gifts from them, which are nice. Um, okay, that's the background. And there's my fort. Chapter 23. Lady Thornton um, reads, well, try, it snatches Ruth's letter out of her hands. And we learn that Ruth's mom is still in the German internment camp all by herself. And we learned that she can only, she's allowed to only write one letter per week. So she has to, you know, it, it's up to four and five weeks before Ruth will get another letter from her mother. So she has to write to her grandfather, grandmother um, back in Germany and her other family members back in Germany and her father. And then I guess after four weeks, it's Ruth's turn. That must be awful, right? Awful. Um, all right, that was really crummy. I thought of Lady Thornton. Sometimes authors put in characters that just get so angry with, you know. Um, I hope she comes around. I know I've said that before. Chapter 23. That night, Susan filled our dinner plates herself and carefully set one down in front of each of us. Lord Wolton Pie, the baked mess of oatmeal and vegetables. Only mine, and I saw, looking around the table, Ruth's and Jamie's, had cut up pieces of lamb mixed with it. Lamb and the lamb gravy with wine and rosemary. Susan's and Lady Thornton's did not. With the addition of meat, the Lord Wolton Pie wasn't half bad. Lady Thornton picked through her serving. Is this supposed to be some sort of punishment? She asked. Of course not, Susan replied. You and I ate our share yesterday. The whole point of rationing is that everyone gets their fair share. Ruth's eyes flicked to mine. She didn't smile, but I felt like she was thinking a smile. I thought a smile back at her. <laughs> I like that. I thought a smile back at her. That really was all the meat we got, though, for the next two straight weeks. We'd used up our coupons and we couldn't get more, not without buying meat on the black market, which meant illegally outside the ration. Lady Thornton had enough money to do that, but she... She said she also had too much honor. February continued cold and bleak. The sun rose late and set early, and between that and the blackout, it really did seem like we were living in a cave. Susan fell into a gloom. 
She was never as sad as she'd been when we first came to live with her. She got out of bed every day, but she rarely smiled, and she slept more than I thought she should. <coughs> Excuse me. One morning, my school schoolwork felt unbearable. Ruth was squirreled away with her maths, and Jamie outside trying to dig a garden plot in the frozen ground. Susan sat dully and dully in front of her sewing machine, rearranging some pins, but not stitching anything. I shoved aside my grammar book and said, why don't we train the dragons? Susan looked up. What? Well, Fred says horses fought in the last big war. Yes, she said, and in every war before that. They're not much use in modern times, though, not against tanks and aircraft and heavy artillery. Right, I said, so why not dragons? I'd been thinking it through. The kind that can fly. If we took them out of the zoos and we trained them, maybe they could attack German planes without even needing pilots on board. It would be much safer for Jonathan. A grin spread slowly across Susan's face. Ada, she said, you do understand that dragons are mythical creatures. As if I knew what she meant by mythical, I stared at her. Imaginary, said Susan, made up, pretend, the stuff of fairy tales. She coughed and then started to laugh. My dear, oh, I'm sorry. It's wonderful. Why don't we train the dragons? She laughed harder. That served Hitler a couple of ranks of dragons and the ghost of St. George. I'd never seen Susan laugh like this. I picked up the closest thing at hand, the grammar book, and threw it hard across the room. It narrowly missed Lady Thornton coming through the front door. She bent to pick it up and smoothed it in her hands. Ada, she said sternly, we do not throw books. <laughs> Susan was still laughing. I know I should stop. I'm not being kind. Stop what? asked Lady Thornton. Susan said, she wants to train dragons to fight Hitler. <laughs> it is kind of funny. Nobody told me they aren't real, Lady Thornton considered. A pity they aren't, she said. It would be an excellent plan, except I suppose the Germans would also have dragons. Bigger dragons, Susan said. Stronger, taller, blonder dragons. She looked ready to laugh again. How am I supposed to know what's real and what isn't? I shouted. Nobody tells me. Nobody tells me anything. Ada, Susan said, recovering herself. I'm sorry I laugh, but be fair. I tell you things all the time. Fairy tales, Lady Thornton said. What you need is a proper dose of fairy tales. Then you can move on to mythology. I'll fetch some books from Look Thornton House. I said, you have more books than what you brought here already? Oh, my, yes. We left most of them on the shelves in the library. Imagine their own library. Thornton House had a library. Lady Thornton brought over volumes of fairy tales. Susan read them to Jamie and me all through the rest of that dreary month. She explained after each story what was real and what wasn't. I could have guessed most of it. I already knew that animals couldn't talk and that people couldn't really fly or weren't born so small that they could sleep in a teacup. But it was hard to see how unicorns, for example, were less real than horses. Dragons still seemed dead useful to me. Winged lizards? Why not? Angels were people with wings. It was hard to see the difference. Ruth stayed downstairs to listen to the fairy tales. I've never heard them in English before, she said. Whoops, sorry. Jamie said, they have stories in Germany? You ne never thought of Germans telling stories. Ruth looked offended, but then she usually did. Ruth looked offended, sorry. Of course we have stories in Germany, she said. Most of these stories came from Germany. They were German first. I didn't want to believe her, but Lady Thornton pursed her lips and said it was true. The Brothers Grimm were German, she said. I didn't think anything good came from Germany. When I said so, Lady Thornton disagreed. I traveled through Germany extensively when I was younger, she said. Dresden is a beautiful city, very cultured. You can't judge the whole country by Hitler. I said, but you judge Ruth by Hitler. Lady Thornton's head snapped up, angry. Ruth bit her lip, and Susan outright smiled. Susan finally found a book about dragons at the village library. St. George, the patron saint of England, was supposed to have killed a dragon, and so was a saint named Margaret of Antioch. 
It amused me to think that Mar uh, Maggie had been named for a dragon killer. But saints were supposed to have been real people, not imaginary. And dragon dragons were imaginary, not real. How could a real pe person kill an imaginary animal? The stories get a little mixed up, Susan said. These particular saints lived a very long time ago. Back when people were stupid, like me? Ada, said Susan. If you say things like that, I'll make you write lines. I didn't know what lines meant. I didn't care. I repeated, stupid like me. Susan made me sit at the table until I'd written the sentence, I will not continue to conflate lack of intelligence with lack of knowledge 100 times. It took hours. I considered refusing to do it, but the expression on Susan's face made me pick up a pencil instead. I will not continue to conflate lack of intelligence with lack of knowledge. We are going to talk about that. What's conflate, I asked. Combining two ideas that ought to be kept separate, Susan said. You are going to stop doing it. Tell me all the things that are imaginary, I said. When I'm done with these stupid lines, I want to make a list. I can't, Susan said. It would be an infinite list. Anything you can make up inside your head is imaginary. I thought about this. So love is imaginary. No, no, Susan said. Love exists outside your head. Think harder, harder, Ada. Stop being so cross. Every day Ruth saw me wearing my jod purse. Every day she saw me going to the stables. Every day when I came back smelling of horses and hay, she sniffed the air longingly. She looked enormously sad. Butter made me happy every single day. Lady Thornton hardly ever went to her own stables. She said she was too busy with the WVS to ride often, and she never, ever did chores. You can't take Ruth with you if Lady Thornton won't allow it, Susan said. She does have that authority. I wasn't used to being envied. To my surprise, I didn't like it at all. What do you think's going to happen? Yeah, I think I think that too. <laughs> um, also, I want you to be thinking about if you think there's a difference between intelligence and, um, or sorry, well, b between intelligence and, and knowledge or a lack of intelligence and a lack of knowledge. Is there a difference between those two things? Conflate, combining two ideas that ought to be kept separate. Cool. All right, we're going to do some more uh, thinking on that just when we're together. Chapter 24. Lord Thornton telegraphed that he was coming home for the weekend. We tried hard to make things nice for him. Instead of ducking her share of the housekeeping, Lady Thornton actually mopped the kitchen floor and polished the brass on the fireplace, and she queued for three hours to get our bacon ration while Susan stood in a separate queue for fish. Lord Thornton arrived in his car, to our surprise. I wondered how he'd gotten the gasoline. He brought gifts for all of us. A piece... <clears throat> Sorry, excuse me. <clears throat> Excuse me. A piece of chocolate for Jamie, a potted plant for the kitchen table, a small bottle of perfume for Lady Thornton, and four new bars of smooth, silky, scented soap, one each for Lady Thornton, Susan, Ruth, and me. To my astonishment, I was actually happier to get nice soap than I would have ch been chocolate. Soap was on ration, and all we could usually get was war soap, unscented and harsh. It made me itch. I'd gotten used to daily baths and nice soap living with Susan. Odd when you thought about it. Ma'am hadn't been much for keeping us clean. Ruth stared at her soap as though she were afraid of it. She looked close to tears. I wondered what she was thinking. I didn't understand her at all. Lord Thornton was still scary, very tall, in a looming sort of way, but now he spoke to me as though I was someone he knew well and also as though he rather liked me. You look as though you're getting around quite easily, he said, even better than at Christmas time. I realized he was talking about my foot. I didn't want him talking about my foot. Thank you, I said. Across the room, Ruth looked up, interested. Does it hurt anymore, he asked. Of course not, I said, though it did sometimes. Good, he said, very good. What happened to your foot? Ruth asked that night as we climbed the stairs to bed. Nothing, I said. Susan called it a club foot, Ruth said. I know, I said, and closed my bedroom door. Ada! 14 minutes.
almost 15. Ooh, one more. Chapter 25. A week later, Maggie came home for half term. I met her train at the village station. I can't believe my father brought home a German, she said. What's she like? Not as odd as I, at odd as I thought she'd be, I said. Of course, she might be pretending, trying to trick us into feeling safer. Though the longer I knew Ruth, the more ordinary she seemed. Your mother hates her, I added. Maggie nodded. I'm not surprised. Maggie stood in the middle of our bedroom, her hands on her hips. I stood beside her. The two halves of the room no longer matched. I'd stripped the frilly coverlet and pillows from my bed and removed the lacy curtain thing that went around the bottom of it. I'd taken the curtain off my side of the window. I'd thrown my dictionary in with Maggie's books on the shelves, moved my box to my bedside table, <clears throat> and scooted the rug partially under Maggie's bed so it didn't lay on my half of the floor at all. Did my mother do this? Maggie asked. Yes, I said. She shook her head, lips firmly pressed together. I can't believe it. It's not fair. She grabbed the edge of the rug and tugged on it. Help me, she said. This needs to go in the middle. It's for both of us. It's not, I said. It's yours. That's ridiculous. As if I wouldn't share anything I had with you. She centered the rug on the floor. I thought we had two of those coverlets, she said. I know for a fact we had two sets of pillows. She flung open the wardrobe door. There, stuffed against the back on the floor, were the extra pillows. Well, your mother did put them on my bed, I said. I just didn't like them. Maggie looked at the pillows and back to me. Oh, she said. Well, you don't have to take them. I thought my mother didn't want to let you use them. That's all. No, I said. I felt a little uncomfortable. She wanted to share. She just went ahead and did everything without asking me. Maggie nodded. I know. She's always like that. She sat down on the edge of her bed. What do you want? I think we should both, both use the coverlets. That way our beds would match, like we were sisters. Sisters? Maggie scowled. Don't sound so horrified. I always wanted a sister. I never thought about having a sister. Well, I don't mind the coverlet, I said, if we can get rid of those lace things around the beds. The dust ruffles? Deal. Maggie and I rode out together to the top of our lookout hill. It was lovely to have company on my rides again. I miss you, I said. Maggie nodded. She scanned the sea from side to side, the way we always did, checking for spies. I miss you too, she said. I miss everything. School's wretched in wartime. I'd give anything to be home. Three girls have gotten telegrams so far, she continued. There's this long drive from the road leading up to the school, and you can see the whole of it from every classroom window. Whenever the telegraph boy turns down the drive, all of us are watching him by the time he gets to the door. We all stand at the windows, not breathing, hoping his message isn't for us. That reminds me of uh, the third part in Echo, for those of you who read it. I'd seen a messenger bicycling around the village. I said, when ma'am died, I got a letter, not a telegram. The military sends telegrams, Maggie said. Sometimes they say wounded or missing in action. The three that came to our school all said dead, two brothers and a father. She paused. We watched the boy bicycling up the drive and then the head calls someone out of class and we all know what's happened. And we're just glad it wasn't us that was called. We don't feel sad as much as relieved. It's horrible. Jonathan wasn't my brother and I still worried about him. I couldn't imagine having to think about telegrams and Jamie. Getting a telegram here would be just as bad as getting one at school, I said. Maggie turned to me. Her eyes looked dark and her pinched face. That's not true, she said. When we got home, there was a letter waiting for Maggie. I looked at it anxious, anxiously, but Maggie's face lit up. It's from my grandmother, she said, from Scotland. Ruth spun around. For one brief moment, her face glowed with joy. Her expression fell so quickly into her usual solemn, solemnness that I wouldn't have believed it had I hadn't seen it. It, it, it. Sorry, believed it if I hadn't seen it. Oh, she said, your grandmother, not mine. She turned and went up the stairs. I heard her lock her bedroom door. Maggie was laughing. My grandmother's got a bunch of evacuees staying with her, she said. A whole dozen boys. She says it's worse than when my father and his brothers were small. 
Maggie's grandmother in Scotland was Lord Thornton's mother. Maggie had explained it to me. Before the war, Maggie used to visit her every summer and every Christmas. Grandmothers sounded cozy, but so did mothers, and my mother had been dreadful. It was hard to imagine how my grandmother might have been. Anyhow, Susan had made inquiries. No one knew of any other family for Jamie and me. At dinner time, I asked Ruth, Are you expecting a letter from your grandmother? Ruth shrugged. My mother says there is still hope. She hunched over her plate and wouldn't say anything more. So her grandmother is back in Germany. And if she's Jewish by this time, more than likely she's in uh, a concentration camp. All right, we're going to stop there for today. We'll start chapters 26 tomorrow. Intelligence and knowledge. What do you think? Um, think about other ideas that you might conflate or conflate. I'll have to see how to pronounce that word. Uh, tips on a fort. And good job you guys sending in your work. You know, it's not due till Friday. It makes me think that maybe I was a little easy on you this week. Maybe you need some more. Um, okay. As always, I hope you guys are well and are doing well and uh, I miss you. And I'll see you tomorrow at morning meeting. Okay, bye.